All righty. Uh, good, well, good evening, everyone. We're excited to have you here today. We may have a few more folks join us over the next uh, few minutes, but just in the interest of all of your time, I would like, to, I guess we can get started. Um, thank you all for joining us for tonight's All Roads Lead to Overland webinar. Uh, my name is Bill Prescott. I'm one of the Senior Assistant Directors of Admission here at Overland. And I, again, on behalf of our office, congratulations to all of you. Welcome to the Overland Class of 2025. Uh, we're so excited to uh, get to hear from you and get to learn from you and so excited to see all the amazing things you'll do at Overland. Uh, tonight's webinar um, is, we're fo is focusing a little bit on a few years down the line, but we're looking at after Overland. So what we're going to talk about in our, in our conversation this evening really focuses on what you do after you graduate from Overland. So career, different career paths and opportunities, um, different advising resources, our Center for, our Creative, Center for Career Development Center resources, um, and, you get to, and you're going to get to hear from our wonderful group of panelists who I'll have introduced themselves in a second. Uh, just for some quick housekeeping items, um, if you have any questions that come up throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A function um, that you can find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll be using that to answer questions uh, throughout tonight's webinar. Um, and we'll also be posting links um, in, the, in the chat function for all of you during the conversation. Uh, with that, I will turn turn it, things over to my wonderful colleague and, mod, and our moderator for this evening, Laura Badeau, to have her introduce herself as well as our panelists. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Bill. Um, I'm Laura Badeau. I'm Associate Dean in Arts and Sciences and Associate Professor of English, and I'm so delighted to be moderating this panel. Part of the pleasure of moderating the panel is to get to reconnect with Oberlin alums. Uh, but before we start, I want to ask my uh, co-panelists, fellow panelists, to introduce themselves. Hi, welcome. My name is Maureen Peters. I use she, her, hers. And I've been at Oberlin for about 15 years now. Um, I teach in the biology department, and I tend to teach lots of students with varied interest. Um, most recently, I've taken on the role of directing pre-health and pre-medical students. So I deal with students um, from when they come in until when they leave, and also the alumni. All of the support I provide extends beyond um, the graduation date as individuals choose um, medical or health careers. Hi everyone, my name is Shine Arthur. I use she or hers. I graduated from Overland in 2020 this past May. Um, and currently right now I'm working as a medical scribe um, where I write notes for doctors in, in the high school setting. Um, while at Oberlin, I got my degree in biology and a minor in chemistry and in the fall, I'll be attending medical school. Hi everybody, um, my name is Kayla. I prefer she, her pronouns. I am a senior, so class of 2021, and I am a triple major in politics, law and society, and gender, sexuality, and feminist studies. Um, I am on a pre-law track, so I'm going to be attending law school in the fall of 2021. Um, but some things that I've been involved in on Oberlin's campus have been um, being an RA, a residential assistant. I've been a peer advising leader, a peer advisor in the Career Center, um, and I've worked in admissions since my freshman year. Hi everyone, uh, Mahmoud Mahmoudov. I graduated from college in 2016. I used to see him his. Uh, I came to Oberlin from Georgia where I grew up um, to play baseball or just grew to play baseball there and so did that uh, for most of my time on campus. Uh, I was also involved in student government and was a TA for the politics and environmental studies departments. Um, and when I graduated, I was fortunate to get the Rhodes Scholarship. So I went off to Oxford after for a graduate degree. I uh, got a master's in political theory. And uh, after that, went off and uh, worked in speech writing for a bit uh, before joining the Biden campaign. Uh, fortunately, we were successful. Um, so I'm presently uh, in Washington, D.C., working at the White House um, on the COVID response team. So I uh, hope you all have been able to get vaccinated. Thanks, Mahmoud. I just got my second vaccine shot yesterday, so I'm a little woozy. Um, I'm Jesse Gersten. I graduated from uh, the college in 2007, so 14 uh, years ago. I majored in um, uh, French as well as uh, a, a major called Third World Studies, which is really a combination of politics and international development. Um, I'm now the director of sustainability at a renewable energy company uh, focused on uh, solar and batteries. Um, and I will be coming back to Oberlin this year to teach a new course on sustainable business. So I'm really excited to uh, have, that, have that opportunity and, and hopefully meet some of you um, on campus. 
Thank you all. So the goal of this session is really to give you a sense of how Oberlin prepares you for a, a successful, meaningful career. But we really, so we wanna blend uh, information as Bill mentioned, but also interlace it with some personal narratives because that's an, often a more compelling way to uh, learn about how an institution prepares its graduates for life after college. So I thought we could start with our two alumni, uh, Mahmoud and Jesse. Well, Cheyenne, you are too, but we'll start with the, with alumni who are further out. Um, and I wanted to ask you both how your liberal arts education at Oberlin prepared you for your next step after graduation. So Mahmoud, why don't we start with you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think there are two things that primarily come to mind. Number one, no matter what you major in, you know, writing and reading are, are a core part of whatever program you end up taking at Oberlin. And uh, I want to share a story that not a lot of people know. And uh, my mom might get kind of mad at, so don't tell her. Uh, but I came out of high school, I took what's called the first year seminar at Oberlin, uh, which is a smaller group seminar that's focused uh, on, a, on a kind of narrower topic. And you go through it with a group of about eight people and you write a paper uh, that your professor evaluates every week. And so I come in, you know, I'm feeling good about myself. I've, I've gotten accepted to Oberlin. I'm, I'm starting off and I'm having a good time. Uh, I'm really enjoying my classes. And my first paper that I submit, I end up getting a C minus on, uh, which is not something that I was used to just because, you know, I'd done fairly well in high school. Uh, and the paper was on uh, the history and science of medicine, uh, which is not really something I had much of a background in, but was you know, a good example of the kind of interdisciplinary class that you would end up taking in a first year seminar. Uh, so I was really freaked out uh, because I didn't do so well. So I went with my professor and I think a, a core part of the Arts college experience is the fact that you can develop a very close relationship with those first year seminar professors in particular, really all professors. Uh, and they help you, uh, you know, use your reading and your writing tools as a way to explore, you know, whatever subject it is that you end up focusing on down the right, down the line. Um, so you learn how to research well, you learn how to argue persuasively, uh, put together a compelling narrative. Um, and by the end of the class, I ended up getting an A, uh, just because I, you know, was able to work closely and very hard with with that professor one on one. Um, so I, so I wouldn't, uh, you know, discount the the value of having that you know, close level of interactions with your, your professors, I think is very pervasive throughout the liberal arts experience. Um, secondly, something I very much preached about Oberlin that uh, kind of manifests itself, not just in the academic culture, but in how people spend their time, you know, socially and in their extra, uh, extra cooklers, uh, is that you're not relegated to just doing one thing. And I think that's something that, you know, manifests itself in the liberal arts college curriculum. Uh, I changed my major formally three times. Uh, in my head, I changed it five times. Uh, so I took courses spanning everything from economics to English to politics, uh, even creative writing until I figured out that I probably shouldn't be a creative writer. Um, but I found that to be very helpful even my current career. Uh, when I was working on the campaign, uh, I didn't focus on public health until you know the pandemic hit. And uh, very quickly I had to learn a lot about epidemiology. And I was able to do that because I'd done the same kind of thing in Oberlin. You know, I would be in a semester taking four different classes and four different subjects and uh, kind of quickly have to come to terms with what you know, how to be successful in all of them. Um, so I still use that skill now and uh, would say it very much, you know, presents itself in different ways every day at the White House. Thank you, Mahmoud. Jesse. Yeah, and you know, just building off that, I think similarly to Mahmoud, I'm sure a number of other students at Oberlin, you know, I found myself being one of these people who took on many different kinds of uh, courses, different kinds of, um, you know, I did two majors and two minors you know, did sports, you know, was in the, um, the co-op system. So you really end up, um, you know, for those who are interested in exploring a number of different options, there's a lot there. And I really think the value of the liberal arts education and, and Oberlin specifically is it really, it really helps you pull in all of these different disciplines and think creatively and think outside the box in a number of situations. So since graduating, I have always found myself in, um, in, in positions professionally where you end up thinking about strategy and really needing to think um, uh, about how the entire system is working or oftentimes not working and right, the challenge is to try to get something working again. And I think by pulling in all of these different disciplines and really knowing how to think and really how to think um, creatively and productively and also work with people to do that, it's, I've, I've been able to really draw on that education and apply it in a number of different ways. So I've ended up throughout my um, career working in different fields and not necessarily ones that seem related one to the next, but there has been a, a thread and that all has really, you know, stemmed from 
the uh, the liberal arts education that you know that I got um, while at Oberlin. Just a quick follow up. You both mentioned experiences outside the classroom. So Mahmoud baseball. I know you were on student senate. Jesse, you were involved in um, the Shansi program. So can you speak a little to how extracurriculars or co-curriculars also participated in helping you uh, be flexible and creative in your careers post Oberlin? Sure, I'll offer a quick response. I mean, sometimes jokingly, I would I would tell my friends, you know, while at Oberlin, I my major really should have been extracurriculars. I feel like I was involved in everything, um, you know, outside of you know outside of class, and then class was kind of the icing, you know, on on top. Um, there are just so many different things that you have the opportunity to try out at Oberlin. Um, I, I was very involved and got really excited by a number of the student-led EXCO courses. You know, everything from taking auto mechanics to working in early childhood education um, to, you know, volunteering. There's just a lot of opportunities. And if you want to take advantage of that, you, you really can draw on all those experiences and it really feeds into both what you're learning in class, but then also what you take out of, um, you know, the entire experience of the, you know, four or five years on campus. Yeah, I mean, something big that I, uh, I think internalized at Oberlin have been, you know, trying to carry on since then. Uh, is that a life well lived is not just one thing. You know, it's not just your work or not just your studies. It is uh, the way you serve others. It is the relationships you have. It's how you appreciate art and music and all those things. Um, and Oberlin was a fantastic place for me to, to kind of get the seed of that and, and try to continue in my life. And even now, I mean, I work in politics, but uh, I try to write regularly. I, I recently published in a literary magazine. Um, so I've, I've kept that spirit alive. Um, and secondarily, I think uh, a side benefit of kind of doing 20 different things at once, which I think every Oberlin student kind of feels the temptation of, uh, is that you learn how to work hard and you learn how to, to organize your time. Um, and certainly you're not gonna be able to pull everything off if, if you, you know, aren't able to do that. And that's been something that's really been helpful to me, uh, just kind of from a professional skill standpoint, uh, moving on from school and still being able to kind of juggle six things at once. Mm -hmm. Can you both just quickly speak to the support you received in uh, your fellowship application process? Jesse, should we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I did a few different things um, while at Oberlin. I, I was part of a uh, Bonner Scholars um, program um, as a student there. And so, you know, this is a, a program where you um, really get support for doing uh, volunteer work in the community. And I was quite involved with that and, and, and did a number of different um, job placements through that. Uh, upon graduating in, in my senior year, uh, I applied to several different fellowships, um, worked with some professors as, as advisors to help prepare applications and had a few different options um, upon graduating to, to, to choose from. I ended up going with a fellowship called uh, Shansi um, which has very close ties to Oberlin College. It's actually um, housed in the town of Oberlin. Um, and I uh, did a fellowship to go uh, teach for two years in Indonesia um, right after, for, after graduating. Um, and from there, I ended up staying in Indonesia and, and working um, on, uh, on different issues um, for another five years in, in Indonesia. Um, I continue to be quite heavily involved in uh, the Shansi program now and supporting uh, current students who are applying or interested in applying, and then those who are actually then um, selected to then go out uh, in their different placements. So there are a lot of different fellowship opportunities. I, I was able to take advantage of a few of them and feel lucky for having done that. And it really continued for me, the Oberlin experience, even beyond graduating uh, as part of this um, fellowship that has very close ties to the college and to other students. And for me, so I, I applied to about 10 different fellowship opportunities uh, while I was at Oberlin and succeeded in getting two of them. And I know all of you will have much higher success rates than, than I did. Um, but I say that just to say that uh, Oberlin is the kind of place that makes those opportunities available to you and, and pushes you to, to feel like you're in a position to succeed um, just because we do have Oberlin recipients of you know, basically every major American fellowship in, in the country. Um, and it's different versus a you know, larger institution. I have you know, friends that go to places like Yale and for them, they're all kind of competing and, and it's kind of a more uh, insular environment in terms of getting institutional support. Whereas for everything that I applied for, I had a professor uh, or a mentor that came to me and approached me and, and kind of put the idea in my head. And that's something I really appreciate about the school that I, I learned later on is not a given at, at different places. 
Um, so I was able to get something called the Truman Scholarship, which is a, a public service uh, fellowship um, that's, that's national. And if I'm correct, I think in a couple of weeks, we're going to find out whether or not our uh, two finalists from this year won. And if they do, then Oberlin will be uh, the highest, uh, will have the highest number of Truman Scholarship recipients of any liberal arts college in the country, uh, which is, you know, obviously amazing. Um, and then for the roads, uh, you know, very involved experience. You have to get eight letters of recommendation. And I really do feel like I had an advantage going to Oberlin because I had those close relationships with professors uh, who kind of speak and write on my behalf. Um, and then once I got to Oxford, you know, I very much felt academically prepared because I had come from Oberlin. Um, so Oberlin is a great place if you're interested in graduate school generally, but specifically getting funding for it from one of these fellowship programs. Uh, there's a very clear pipeline and a dedicated staff uh, of people that work with you on that. Um, and, and I can't speak uh, more highly of them. Thank you. So Mahmoud did not anticipate uh, the turn to public health in his career, but Cheyenne, I know med school is obviously, you know, where you're headed. So can you tell us a little bit about your plans for med school? Um, why, I think you chose the University of Maryland, is that correct? Yes, I did. So we'd love to hear, you, I, you, you got into a number of schools, how did you choose that school? And then, you know, once you tell us a little bit about that, how, what kind of support you received in the med school process? Mm -hmm. So I guess from that, I'll start from the beginning, um, just with my pre-med journey through Oberlin. Um, I think that my journey through Oberlin was really unique in the sense that I always felt supported, um, whether that be from my professors, um, my classmates, or the pre-medical health directors or things like that, like Professor Peters. <laughs> um, they were just always supportive of my goals and my intentions to help me really um, narrow down and make choices. But you know, after graduating from Oberlin, I worked as a medical scribe and I did that while applying to medical school. So after taking the MCAT um, and, you know, submitting a number of applications, um, I really just decided to pick my school, the University of Maryland, based off of um, their overall mission. And I think that what made Maryland different from a lot of medical schools that I was noticing was that they have an actively anti-racist curriculum. And they're also very invested in social justice, similar to the values and things that I saw at Oberlin. So I think that um, being in a place like Oberlin really opened my eyes to what I wanted to, like the environment that I wanted to be in the future. And I think that really helped me down the line, especially with making connections and networking with all the people that I had available to me at Oberlin. Professor Peters, do you want to elaborate on the kind of um, support that you offer as a pre-med advisor? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so as Cheyenne mentioned, it is quite complicated to go down certain pathways, um, particularly medicine. So we kind of try and nurture the students that are interested in health careers in general and medical careers. And I um, will meet with students prior to even entering Oberlin. Um, as well as as soon as they arrive to sort of give them a well-rounded sense of what they need to think about um, in order to be you know any of the health professions and of course that requires certain classes um, but as Cheyenne mentioned you know a physician or anyone in healthcare ideally understands how to relate to their patients and how to use the system to their advantage to support people as best they can, to educate them, um, to show compassion and empathy, and to create support networks um, from that personal relationship as well as systemically. So, you know, as they're going through Oberlin, you know, there's lots of co-curricular, extracurricular activities that can help with that. Um, there's, of course, lots of research going on on campus, and it's important um, to know how medical and biomedical um, information is gained. So many students will take part in that sort of um, exploration. And then there's um, active student groups that are really interested in the health careers that bring back panelists and meet and you know brainstorm activities that they find useful, as well as um, things on campus like HIV or HIV peer testers and exco's um, that are focused on um, sexual health and awareness. So there's just a lot going on. So I um, navigate that with the students and then find you know some of the support that they'll need while they're here and encourage them to use the summers and winter terms. Um, that's another really awesome way that students explore different interests as well as career options. 
And then the formal stuff, the application process um, is supported by Oberlin as well. And depending on which pathway you go, um, it can be quite complicated for medical students. It takes up to 18 months to really do those applications um, as well as, as lots of lots of investment of time, um, lots of letters of rec, lots of essay writing, interview skills, um, and networking with um, former alum or former students who are now alumni, um, getting insight into the best way to present themselves. And as Cheyenne mentioned, you know, how to find the fit for their particular goals in health. Um, so, and it's, I do a lot of that, but I also have a committee um, of faculty and staff that help me and I collaborate with the Career Development Center and as well, you know, all the faculty members um, are very supportive of students in whatever path they pursue and we do have tons of um, health graduates so there, there's a big community around that particular um, theme of service. Thank you, Maureen. So, so Kayla is here to talk to us about the pre-law path. Unfortunately, the pre-law advisor, uh, Maureen Peters has an equivalent for pre-law. Dustin Evett Young could not be here this evening because he's participating in a senior launch program, but Bill will share um, his information in the chat. And he will be at the two virtual department fairs to talk about pre-law at Oberlin. But Kayla, we're really eager to hear from you. What are your law school plans? Um, and then tell us a little bit about the support you received in applying to law school. I'm more than happy to. Um, so I saw a question in the chat actually that was asking if there were Ivy League opportunities um, coming out of Oberlin. And I actually was choosing between University of Michigan and Cornell for law school. Um, so there absolutely are. Um, I ended up going with University of Michigan. I actually committed this week. Um, so that's where I'm going to be going in the fall. But the kind of whole process, I feel like Cheyenne said it really well in terms of um, pre-med and pre-law, although very different in a lot of ways, is very similar in the fact that Oberlin professors in the Oberlin community are committed to kind of supporting you through the process. Um, and they're committed, whether it's, you know, Dustin, who is the pre-law advisor, who I have a fantastic relationship with and is actually my boss in another situation. Um, to, uh, you know, I reached out to someone to like book a study room so that I could prepare for my LSATs and they were more than happy to do it and just like so excited and like would check in on me and support me through that process. And so for me, I think it was often the little things that I really noticed and sure a lot of schools are going to have, you know, this and that when it comes to like systematic support. Um, but I know the first time I took my LSAT literally every Oberlin person came up to me and was like, how did it go? Like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, Oberlin alums were, were there for me. And so for me, it was just kind of all about those little things and making the, the victory that much sweeter in, in that way. Well, let, let's turn to a question in the chat here. It's related, I think, to, to what both you and Cheyenne uh, spoke to. So this is for Maureen, Cheyenne, and Kayla. Given that many students don't know what they want to do post Oberlin and that the classroom looks different on the job, what programs does Oberlin have to show students what different career types and options look like, especially day to day? Kayla, you're nodding. You can. <laughs> Um, I'm more than happy to jump in. So um, what comes to mind is actually the programs that the Career Center has built into Oberlin um, to support you in figuring out A, what you want to study while you're here, but then B, what you can do with what you want to study. Um, and so maybe less focus on the what you want to study aspect, but the what you can do with what you want to study. One of the coolest programs that Oberlin has is something called Career Communities, um, where basically you can go ahead and take take a partial credit class for a semester and you are insured to have funding for an internship and an internship in that related field. So I did career communities in law and public policy. There's one in nonprofit, there's one in the arts. Um, and essentially that is a really good zoom into the day-to-day -day because you meet with Oberlin alums who are in that field. You do preparation and kind of how to get internships specifically for that field. Um, how to do like cold emails, just kind of the works. Um, and that maybe is preparation for how to go about finding 
your future in a lot of ways. Um, but then when it comes to the day to day, I think a lot of time with the interdisciplinariness of classes and the discussion basis of classes and kind of all of these things, you are really applying what you're learning to a real life scenario. But I would say career communities is, is one of the coolest programs that we have to kind of propel you forward. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Maureen, sorry. Oh, I was just going to follow up. I think Career Communities is an awesome resource. Um, and as Kayla said, they really cover a, um, many, many different fields. And so um, health has its own, you know, I think pretty much anything you could want to do is going to be found broadly in one of these career communities. Um, and as Kayla mentioned that there's internship possibilities. And I one thing I'd, I'd love the students to comment on is um, winter term. So that's a really odd I shouldn't say odd, unique, um, wonderful thing about Oberlin that sometimes is quite mysterious, I think, um, for outsiders. But more or less in typical years, and this is obviously not a typical year, uh, we still have winter terms, but it's a little bit different how we did it this year. But in general, um, during January, uh, students can do a variety of things, but all of these are opportunities to explore. So it could be taking an intense class you didn't have time to do, but that's quite rare. Usually um, it's going out and interning, volunteering, um, studying a different area, doing career exploration. In my field, many people um, who are interested in health or research will do research with an Oberlin faculty member on campus, or they might do that research um, at a medical or research center near their home. Um, Oberlin alumni often send back requests for winter term students. Um, and so this is about three weeks long. Um, and so students um, engage in some active kind of pursuit that helps them develop um, career skills, a deeper understanding of the career path, the day to day, because they are literally doing it, you know, for a, an intense three week period, and it builds their network. Um, so I really think winter term is just um, such an amazing thing and such a great opportunity for students that really is very unique to Oberlin. And what's different, you know, is that students can't be paid. Um, and, you know, there aren't other college students out there looking to do things during January, whereas in the summer, um, again, Oberlin students do wonderfully, but of course, every college student is out looking for that opportunity. But a lot of Oberlin students have already kind of, you know, nailed down what they're doing for the summer because they set up that network um, and they made the relationship during January um, when, you know, no one else was out there trying. So there's tons of opportunities. Well, Maureen, you mentioned network. So there's a question here. Uh, and I think uh, Mahmoud and Jesse, this is a question you both might want to uh, respond to. What impact did the alumni network have on your experience at Oberlin and your subsequent career paths? Definitely. So, so I think the key thing about Oberlin's alumni network is that it's both uh, very broad and very deep. Uh, meaning that no matter what you're interested in, there's definitely an Oberlin alumni that either does that work or explored it at some point and is going to talk to you about it. Uh, and what I mean by the fact that it's deep is that everyone that I've ever interacted with, and I've heard this from other friends too, is incredibly friendly. Um, and I think that's by, uh, you know, kind of a byproduct of the fact that the school is very small and there's kind of a common experience that people go through. Uh, and there's a tremendous fondness that, that alumni, uh, you know, have. That's why, you know, most of us are here right now to, you know, be able to speak to students and share our good experiences. Uh, and it ranges uh, everything from tangible benefits, from internship opportunities that Professor Peter was, was talking about. Um, a lot of employers that are alumni, they directly reach out to the school uh, and offer opportunities because they know that winter term is a thing. They know that students are looking for jobs uh, in the summer. Uh, a lot of alumni set up uh, funds to help students get paid during the summers for their internships um, so that they can you know, make that more financially manageable. Um, and even things like housing. I mean, I, I stayed in uh, an alum's house over the summer once. They didn't charge me anything. Uh, and they were very kind. We, you know, had dinner every now and then. Um, so very good experience. Uh, and so no matter what it is, uh, I think you'll find that there's an incredibly friendly um, and, and warm network that will support you uh, in, in kind of exploring your own path. Well, I'll answer that question by saying, I, I kid you not, Almost every organization that I think is driving change in the field that I focus on, which is really around sustainability, business, um, environment, has someone from Oberlin working there and driving things behind the scenes. Um, and so, it, and it happens over and over. I, I find out about um, 
you know, some really innovative work that's going on in, you know, in sustainable finance, look at who's behind it. And inevitably there's some kind of a connection. I can reach out to them and, and, and have this Oberlin uh, experience to draw on and really kind of get, um, you know, to, to, to kind of take that relationship further. And then on the sort of on the, I would say on the more um, fun side of things, you know, I ended up after um, doing this fellowship I alluded to earlier, the Shanxi fellowship ended up living in uh, Southeast Asia for another seven years. And while I was there, um, you would be surprised how many Oberlin people you run into literally on the other side of the world. And so, you know, I ended up having a lot of time to travel to other countries and to, to visit a, a big part of um, both Southeast and South Asia, um, mostly staying with Oberlin students uh, or alumni along the way. You know, some who I knew from my own time at Oberlin and some who were 30 years out who I could reach out to um, and who offered up, you know, space and, uh, you know, and a motorbike to get around. So the, the alumni network is, is actually quite uh, strong. And I think um, there is this real shared connection and people are incredibly open about um, you know, sharing their own uh, experience, you know, grabbing a coffee or, you know, opening their door um, to alumni. Thank you. So there, so we can, we can talk more about that in a second, but I, I noticed a question here um, following up on the winter term. Can you give some examples of what people tend to do during winter term? So Cheyenne, Kayla, if you and, and Jesse Mahmoud, if you want to just share your winter term experiences, that would be great. I don't mind going first. Um, so during my time at Oberlin, I also played on the basketball team um, and heavy, mostly our season falls in the winter. So I actually stayed on campus at Oberlin for all four years during winter term. Um, and during my freshman year, I took advantage of that by doing research in one of the chemistry labs on campus. Um, so there are just different opportunities with like maybe bench research. Um, I also did down the line independent research where I was just researching different things and the effects of health disparities um, on the health and overall wellness of black African Americans. Um, so just different things like that. Um, you can really make winter term what you want out of it in terms of what you're interested in, whether that's working with um, a professor that shares your same interests, maybe a professor that teaches you in a certain subject, or reaching out, like someone mentioned earlier, to Oberlin alum, but it's just really what you want to make out of it. Um, and there's also two on campus, well, pre-COVID times, like winter term fairs where, um, you know, there's booths set up in the atrium and people just show off the different winter term opportunities that they have available. So I think just making use of opportunities like that um, will really help you find what you want to do during your winter term. Thank you, yeah. Kayla. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there's this fun saying at Oberlin that people do one winter term for fun, um, one winter term for their community and one winter term for their career development. Um, and so that is kind of the route I went. Um, I was also on the women's basketball team um, for a little while. And so I was uh, on campus for my first year and I ended up um, learning American Sign Language through a computer program um, as my first winter term. Um, and then my second winter term, I came home um, and I actually uh, coached a high school or assistant coach for high school women's basketball team and wrote a research paper on women in sports and the space that they take up um, versus men in sports and also including non-binary people in sports. Um, and then finally I did, uh, I took time, I took my sophomore year, not sophomore year, junior year winter term off to study for my LSATs. And then my senior year, um, I actually did a, a research project slash um, like additional resources in terms of an internship that I was going to be doing in international human rights and litigation um, and kind of helping myself prepare um, for the caseload and the things that I would be uh, working on that I had kind of never uh, interacted with before. Mahmoud, Jesse, did you follow the same formula, fun community career? I don't know if I was as, uh, as disciplined and formulaic um, about it, but I did just realize that all four of us have uh, in common, we all, we all did um, sports at Oberlin. So I, I, similarly to Cheyenne and Kayla, one year uh, I ran cross country and track. So I stayed on campus to train for the track season. One year I did a poetry class. One year I decided to go teach in, uh, in a school in, um, outside of Boston. And then the fourth year I worked on building a school in Guatemala. So that kind of gives you the breadth of how I, you know, went, went about it, went about winter term. 
Yeah, I, I was not as fun, so I didn't have a dedicated uh, fun winter term. But uh, I knew going in that I wanted to come out and do something in public service, and so I can use my time to, to try out different opportunities in that space. Uh, so my first winter term, um, I got to work for my hometown congressman, uh, John Lewis, in his office uh, in Atlanta. Uh, my second year, I worked at an environmental nonprofit in D.C. Um, my third year, I worked for the mayor of Atlanta, um, again, back home in the, his office of sustainability. Um, and my fourth year, I studied for the LSAT, so we have that in common. <laughs> uh, but the important thing was that for all the internships I had for those first three years, uh, I did get funding from Oberlin to do it, uh, which was incredibly important, particularly for the second year when I was in D.C. Um, and needed to find a place to stay, uh, which I did through an alumni, and then I was able to get uh, paid for it. So incredibly helpful in terms of having the resources. Well, I know Jesse Mahmoud, you took full advantage of your Oberlin experiences, but we have a question here that's really interesting. So what are some of the opportunities that Oberlin offered you and helped you? And Cheyenne, this is for you as well. Uh, what are some of the opportunities that Oberlin offered you and helped you in your professional life that you would suggest students take more advantage of? Missed opportunities. So I guess I'll, I'll do but I'll do a missed opportunity and I'll do something I take advantage of that I, that I appreciated. Um, missed opportunity. I was not the most artistically inclined person going in. And even now, even though I'm a heavy consumer of, of music, but I do wish that I had gotten involved uh, in more of the creative scene at Oberlin, uh, just because literally every single day there's a concert going on, whether it's a solo performance of someone doing something for their honors project or, you know, a group ensemble or just a band getting together. Um, that's something that I think is very unique about Oberlin that you don't get at other schools that I wish I had I'd spent a little more time doing. Um, but something that I did do that I very much came to appreciate is something uh, in the politics department. Uh, and there's an equivalent in many other departments, but still in the politics department called the Cole Scholars Program, uh, which is a dedicated program where uh, you're chosen for it. And then you take a seminar on campaigns, electoral politics in the spring. Uh, the school funds you to go and work on a campaign uh, that summer, and then you come back and you do an, an academic research paper uh, studying some topic that, that came up during your campaign. Um, and that has been incredibly helpful for me, just in terms of number one, getting professional experience, uh, but also getting plugged into that network of, of people who are willing to allow that, that work on campaigns. Um, and I know a lot of the other departments have similar programs. So that's something I love and, and was very uh, unique about the school that I don't think you get in other places. I mean, this is a this is a fun question because I, I think academically speaking, I mean, what I do now career wise and actually what I'm going to be coming back to Oberlin to teach about is all focused on business and sustainability. Um, I work in the renewable energy industry and I've been working on climate change issues for the past decade. Um, I didn't take a single economics or environmental studies class while at Oberlin. So the irony is this is now what I do, but I did not actually study this at, at undergrad. I wouldn't necessarily call it a missed opportunity though, because I would do it, you know, I would do it the same way again. I think having all of those other experiences, I majored in French, I did politics. Um, you know, I was really into uh, trying out a lot of different things. And um, I almost wonder that uh, for me, that was probably the, the right way to go about it. Because now I'm very, um, you know, certain of the work that I do, but I also had all these other experiences that help, you know, make that certainty even more you know, even more profound. Um, so I'm actually excited to come back to Oberlin because I'm going to be engaged a lot more with the economics and environmental studies um, departments that I never was as a student. Just a quick footnote related to that, Jesse. So Jesse is coming back to campus as part of the launch of the business integrative concentration. Uh, so Jesse, would you just say a word or two about why you think it's particularly exciting that Oberlin is launching this program? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that the business world is in an existential crisis right now. And the way that things have been done for the past 70 years um, is changing rapidly. And what, you know, really the way that sort of the, 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 the school of economic thought that, um, that really drives a lot of businesses and, uh, and really the way that um, we think about business today um, it is not, is not living up to, I think, a lot of the potential that was envisioned 70 years ago when kind of neoliberalism was set out as, as the way forward, you know, a real reliance on individuality and a reliance on markets to solve solutions. And what we have is we have a lot of inequity. 
Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, environmental challenges, social challenges. And so really over the past, I wouldn't say just in the past five to 10 years, but definitely much more acutely in the past five to 10 years, the business world has been catching up to really rethink that entire paradigm of how business is done. Um, why that relates to Oberlin, and again, going back to the first question around a liberal arts education is because we, we need people to think outside the system, right? The, the traditional way of getting into business, which often, you know, we think about going through engineering or going through consulting, going to, um, you know, to, uh, through business school, um, is, is really, you know, not changing the way things are as quickly as they need to be changed to address all of these issues and all, and all these challenges. Um, where the business world is going now is bringing on a lot more deep creative thinkers, um, people who are not necessarily, um, you know, very much versed in, um, in business, but, but thinking of, about entirely new ways for business to um, exist and to, um, to, to live up to, you know, its role in our society. And so the course that I'm going to be teaching in the business program as a whole, I think is really geared towards Oberlin students and geared towards a liberal arts approach to business, my goal is to, um, to, to give students an opportunity to rethink what they know about business in its entirety. Um, and not necessarily that by going through my course or going through the program that they're gonna go into a business role, but more than understanding of how business affects all of the things that we, we work on from you know, Mahmoud's work on you know, COVID-19 to you know, we're talking about law and everything else, it's all interconnected. Um, and so coming with an understanding of how, how it works, but also how it could work differently and seeing that vision um, is really what, what I'm gonna be focused on with, with the course and really excited to work with students on that. And I think there are a lot more opportunities, especially now for graduates to go into business in the ways that interest them most and to have the impact they're looking to have on the world. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily in the same kind of traditional business sense that I think um, we have been, um, you know, been, been led to believe over the, you know, the, the, the past number of decades. So that's what really what this is about. Thank you, Jesse. And you're coming back to teach is certainly a great indicator of how our alumni stay engaged, in, uh, including in the classroom. So Cheyenne, I hope you'll come back and teach at some point. Can we, can we return to the um, regrets question? What, what programs um, opportunities, Cheyenne, do you wish you had taken more advantage of at Oberlin? I think one of the biggest things that I think about when I think about Oberlin is just like the broad Oberlin community. I think um, that one opportunity I wish I took more advantage of, and I just thought about this, was to maybe like shadow Doctors at Mercy. Like we have a hospital, you know, almost basically right on campus. So for me coming into medicine, um, I, I wasn't thinking about that at the time to maybe go in and shadow doctors um, because even right now, like going into medical school um, this coming fall, I don't know exactly what I want to specialize in, but I do not, it want, I want to be in medicine. Um, so maybe having the opportunity to shadow doctors while I was at Oberlin would have helped me in that decision, but um, that's definitely okay. Um, but in terms of one thing that I encourage students to take advantage in are, well, this was more so pre-COVID times, but I don't, for lack of better words, there were many like lunchtime meetings um, where Oberlin would bring in different faculty or different professors from other schools from across the nation to talk about their research or even have from the pre-medical side have um, admissions advisors come in to talk about their medical schools and try to recruit Oberlin students to come to their medical school. So, you know, I, I went to a lot of those different meetings. Um, and then one of those meetings actually resulted in me doing a program at Duke University School of Medicine's on, on their campus and which resulted in me getting an interview there for that school also. So I think really just taking advantage of the people that Oberlin bring to campus um, and the opportunities that they have is really beneficial for down the line. Thank you. And so I think Maureen, related to, to Cheyenne's um, discussion of ways in which there are all, the, all this programming to support the pre-med track, we have a question um, if you don't start on the pre-med track as a freshman, is it too late to start that as a sophomore or junior? No, absolutely not. Um, we have students entering at any phase um, to enter and get everything done in the, the last year. That would be pretty rough. Um, you might need to do a little, you know, stay an extra semester. It, take, it does take probably about at least 
two to three years to get all of those classes done um, in a comfortable manner, I should say. Um, but there's definitely entry points, you know, at any phase. And, you know, sometimes people do wind up picking up a few extra classes after the traditional four years if this is the route they want to go. Um, but there's flexibility there and there are lots of pathways and, you know, the one on one sort of advising that I could provide would be very helpful to students who wanted to join later. Thank you. Uh, Kayla, you had mentioned before how um, how useful the career development center is in terms of the the mentoring the advising and i and i i wanted to know if you could speak to the ways in which the career development center goes to students meaning we don't just wait for students to visit the career development center but through programming the career development center really makes itself available to students so i know you're a pal so if you could talk about the ways in which the career development center um, is connected to the PAL program and maybe just remind everyone what the PAL program is. This is new since I think even Mahmoud. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start with what the PAL program actually is. Um, it stands for Peer Advising Leader and essentially based on the first year seminar um, that you choose, you are grouped with anywhere between 11 to about 15 students um, and a peer advising leader. So someone who is uh, an upperclassman, um, sophomore, junior or senior, and um, they will you will all meet every day during orientation. Um, so essentially it's to provide some, some soft landing as you are adjusting to Oberlin and as you're adjusting to being a college student, having someone who can help guide you. Um, your peer advising leader is also meant to be there for you for everything uh, from the stupid questions like how do you use the printer in the library to like, you know, how do you register for classes? Um, and then from there, you can actually take a partial credit course for the first semester um, that has seminars every other week. Um, and you meet in the evenings and basically discuss deadlines coming up and things that you could um, use some help on. So for example, we have one on winter term to help you brainstorm things you would want to do for winter term or one on um, at drop, um, which is, you know, shuffling around your course registration if you choose to take another class. And so those kind of really help. Um, and within the peer advising uh, leader community, the PAL community, and also your um, first year seminar, which comes from court corresponds with, oh my goodness, corresponds with that. Um, there are a lot of things that the Career Center does to kind of support you. Um, Dean Bodeau said it best, we come to you essentially. Um, so in ways we do that is we'll have a day where we go to your um, first year seminar and discuss kind of what we have to offer. Um, drop in hours that are available for professional staff, but also available with peer advisors like myself um, to help you build a resume if you've never done that, to help you look for an internship in the many kind of systems and servers that we have if you've never done that. Um, the peer advising uh, leader program also has those different dates and kind of events built in around the Career Center when it comes to those partial credit classes as well. Um, and just tons of resources in terms of the professional staff, but also your fellow peers so that, you know, if you don't want to go talk to someone who is a fully functioning adult, you can talk to someone who is a less fully functioning adult who is your peer um, themselves. So those are maybe a couple of the ways that um, the Career Center comes to you as a first year. Thank you, Kayla. We have a question from Mahmoud, which I think speaks to the uh, value of a liberal arts education. Uh, so Mahmoud, why did you choose Oberlin over a university in DC if you knew you wanted to pursue a career in public policy? First, the ask this question is a much more sophisticated thinker than I was at the age <laughs> when I was making this decision. But um, so I mean, I, I was drawn to Oberlin uh, to fulfill my dream of playing baseball in college. So that was my my hook. But I didn't come to realize uh, the wisdom of my decision until after the fact. Um, I think there are a lot of advantages to, to going to Oberlin over a place in DC, uh, namely being that you have the exact same access proximity uh, to the experiences that I think the questioner is referring to in terms of internships uh, that you would at a school in DC. And if anything, it's even better here because of what I talked about previously uh, with the very small and committed alumni network. Uh, for the longest time, uh, you know, Speaker Pelosi's chief of staff was an Oberlin alumni. Uh, there are dozens of Oberlin alumni throughout the Hill. 
Um, several of my White House colleagues are Loyola alumni. So the fact that it's a smaller school and you have that common experience actually, I think, makes it a lot easier uh, to kind of plug in and hear about opportunities and, and get your resume in front of someone uh, versus if you go to a place like, I don't know, you know, GW or something, which is a very large school of many people that are trying to do the same thing. Um, and then overall, I, I think I am a uh, more well-rounded person and probably uh, happier in life because I went to Oberlin because I got to do a lot of things uh, outside of what I thought were my original passions. Um, so, I mean, I got to play baseball, uh, but developed an understanding of service that kind of went outside the context of just, you know, traditional politics and government as we think of it. Um, got to be involved with the Bonner Center, which is a lot of kind of community grassroots level uh, organizing and, and volunteer work. Um, and that very much informed, you know, the work that I do right now, but also what I'm hoping to do in the future. Uh, so I think there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, and when else are you going to live in, in beautiful rural Ohio? So mm -hmm. everyone should have a, a treat of that for four years. And this is not sarcastic. Yeah, no, not a joke. <laughs> well, I think one of the themes of this panel is that Oberlin's strong sense of community gives everyone a competitive edge. Um, and that's, that's a lovely Oberlinian irony. Um, so we have, we have um, a couple pre-med questions. So Maureen, Cheyenne, get ready. Uh, okay. Do pre-med students often get to shadow different positions at Mercy Allen Hospital? What Cheyenne wished she had done. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a program for this or is it on a personal outreach basis? And I'll wait for the, the second question. So um, Oberlin students tend to do very different things to get their patient experience. So some students do take advantage of Mercy um, and there was being developed actually a program, but COVID had pa has paused that. Um, we hope to get back to that post COVID. We also have um, a nursing home that is walkable from campus, as well as um, a retirement community that also is sort of a step into higher care levels. So students um, will be found in all of those settings. Um, and so those are the students that are um, choosing to do that while they take classes. And then other students might choose um, to do those sorts of things during winter term. And winter term um, certainly has lots of on-campus options, but many students do go back to their hometown or explore another area of the country or the world, um, as was mentioned. So um, individuals might do that sort of work in the summers or during winter term at a different location. And a lot of times they're um, connecting with Oberlin alumni that are in the health fields um, in Cleveland or you know Boston, Seattle, uh, wherever it is that they choose to be, they get those experiences. And so the next question along the same lines, what percentage of students go directly to med school versus taking time off to work, study, take the MCAT? Mm -hmm. um, so we have, we don't, you know, Oberlin is a small school, so we never have an overwhelming number um, in any given year going to medical school. The most common path is definitely to take at least one year before going to medical school. Um, that would mean they would be applying as Cheyenne did when they graduated, but because the application takes over a year, um, that would mean they would do one year of work or some other kind of activity before going to medical school. About, I don't know, 10 to 20 percent might go right from Oberlin, which means they apply in the summer of their junior year. This matches national trends. Um, unlike in the past, most students are entering medical school at 24 or 25 on average with many um, with additional years. So those extra years often um, allow one to stretch out all of the sorts of experiences um, that are advantageous and to slow down that application process. Um, as well, you know, just often some people will choose to work a little bit for financial reasons as well. Thank you. And so we're jumping around a lot, but, and I think this question is for you, Jesse. You mentioned the Bonner Scholars Program. Um, so the, this, this uh, audience member would like to know if you could talk more about your Bonner Scholars Program experience and how it helped you in your career development. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And um, Mahmoud, were you also involved? In, I think you mentioned Bonner Scholars as well at one point. So I, I can start off with this question, but feel free to 
to jump in. I mean, the Bonner Scholars Program for me um, was just such a, a fantastic experience while being um, at Oberlin. It's a relatively small cohort. So I don't know if the numbers are exactly the same as they were when I was a student, but they're typically at the time, 10 students kind of per class that are part of this fellowship. Um, you know, I was working very closely with an advisor, the sort of the head of the Bonner Scholar Program um, as, a, as a group, we're coming together um, on a regular basis and really doing a lot of sort of uh, peer mentoring and supporting one another on things related to the community service that we're doing as our commitment to the Bonner Scholarship, but also, you know, career, um, you know, career searches, you know, talking about classes, really just everything, you kind of form this really tight knit um, community. And then beyond campus, the Bonner Scholar Program also has sister campuses, sister, sister programs in, um, I think it's 30 some, I, again, the numbers might have changed, but 30 some other colleges um, across the country. So every year we would also go on a retreat. We'd meet Bonner scholars from other schools. There was a, um, you know, a big uh, festival that would happen. Um, through the Bonner Scholar Program, I would also get additional funding support to go to um, conferences and networking events that I was interested in. So I, I, I took advantage of that every year and, and um, got involved in, in, in a number of different um, sort of uh, conference type uh, events. So it was just yeah, a fantastic um, experience for me, really close knit community. I've stayed in touch with a lot of my um, fellow Bonner scholars uh, post uh, post graduating. And um, I think um, just really fantastic people and yeah, it was a very special, special fellowship. Yeah, and, and so I wasn't a Bonner scholar myself, but at the time uh, when I was at Oberlin, the federal government uh, through AmeriCorps VISTA offered a program called the Bonner Leader Program, uh, which I uh, was in. Uh, not offered anymore, unfortunately, because of changes in, in how uh, VISTA is administered. Uh, but just to say that the, the Bonner Scholar Program is very much uh, kind of the core of all of the different service opportunities at Oberlin. And even if you're not a scholar, you very much benefit from the fact that uh, there is that culture of service at the school that, you know, facilitates anything, literally anything you want to do whether it's something medically oriented uh, or focused on the environment, uh, food access, uh, poverty alleviation, um, there is going to be an opportunity for you to, to, number one, make a difference in someone's life, uh, but number two, kind of develop that aspect of yourself if that's something that you're looking to do longer term professionally. I think it might be fun to end with a lightning round um, question. And this is, I would like you all, and Maureen, please feel free to participate, to share the, the one quality, you, pos what, you possess many qualities, but what do you consider to be a quality that Oberlin helped cultivate in you that you are most grateful for uh, in your Mahmoud and Jesse in, and, and Cheyenne in your current careers, Kayla, when you're thinking about launching? I'll give you a second to think about it. Jesse's ready. Uh, not not being one dimensional. Um, I think others have touched on this in 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 you know tonight's session. Um, I think if I only did one thing, and if that one thing were my career, um, it would be you know I would have some gratification. But um, I think being a just a much more rounded person. I don't know about well rounded, but rounded person. Um, really something I, I picked up at Oberlin. And there was one more question. I don't know if we directly addressed, but I. Just wanted to touch on that I saw in the chat, which was, you know, how do you balance sports and extracurriculars? And I, it's related to this, which is, you know, no one made me do extracurriculars and no one's asking you to do it. It's, you know, you do it because you're, there's just an energy, I think for me, an energy, and I think for other students as well, um, and an excitement to try all these different things. And I think all of those different aspects of, you know, the music and the arts and the courses and everything else that makes up Oberlin um, just creates people who can go out and really, you know, be much more self-fulfilled in going out and tackling the world. Thank you, Jesse. Who wants to go next? Kayla. Um, I'm going to say that the quality that Oberlin really helped for me uh, was learning to embrace my weirdness um, and my uniqueness. Um, Oberlin is a really unique and weird place and I use weird in the most kind of like loving way. Um, and for a long time I was just really self-conscious about that and the things that made me different. Um, and Oberlin really helped me see that actually we need 
people who are different and think outside the box and do things unlike anyone has ever done them to make the world go round. Um, and, you know, that's what makes you, it's so cheesy, but that's what makes you like you and the best version of yourself. And so um, I've really come to terms with how weird I am. And Oberlin has really helped me embrace that. Not only make the world go round, but make it a better place, Kayla. <laughs> Who's next? Mahmoud. I, I wish I knew a better way to articulate this, but I think Oberlin showed me the world in a lot of ways. Um, I grew up in a you know suburban part of Atlanta, uh, very kind of typical cul-de-sac, play baseball, Little League, McDonald's kind of thing. Um, and I didn't know anyone from either coast. Uh, I didn't know anyone whose you know, parent was a professional. Um, I didn't know anyone that lived in rural Ohio. And all of a sudden, over the course of four years, I got exposed to a much more diverse set of people than I've ever experienced in, in the rest of my life. And I think that you take the normal college stressors and you know the challenges that everyone goes through academically and just kind of growing up, and you do it in the context of people who very deliberately come there because they care about other people. Um, and you come out on the back end I, I think just with a much kind of deeper appreciation for um, the variety of people that are in this world and the difficult challenges that arise from having to deal with different groups of people. And whether it was on student senate or through sports or even in some cases academics, uh, I very much feel every single day right now that I benefited from the fact that I had to exist for four years with people that are very different from me. Um, and I think that especially right now in this world, that's something that we all you know, could, could benefit from. Well, think, put. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. I think for me, what I would have to say is communication. Like I mentioned earlier, um, I played on the women's basketball team um, and I played the point guard. And for those of you who don't not familiar with basketball, that's essentially like the leader on the floor, um, the person in charge of, you know, telling the team and the coaches what's what, what's happening. Um, so that really pushed me out of my comfort zone, but I've grown to appreciate that form of leadership and connection with people. I think also within the academic setting too, is just being able to have those group um, collaborations that are, I think very abundant at Oberlin in terms of like maybe group projects or just different group tasks that really make you have to communicate with people. And like Manuk was saying, like people who are different from you, very like appreciating their differences. And I think that just all in all, that's something that's very crucial to medicine. So I'm very grateful um, to have had that experience at Oberlin. Thank you, Cheyenne. Maureen? Um, I guess I didn't exactly get nurtured into adulthood um, at Oberlin, but I came, you know, after lots of training in science, um, being at Harvard Medical School for grad school, and then another like intense postdoc, so 12 years of science. Um, what I learned at Oberlin, you know, I think other people have touched on was just to um, step back and see all the connections between all the different fields. So when I teach about, um, I, I typically teach in the genetics area. So I teach about, you know, 23andMe and why we're doing it and what is ancestry and what is identity and, you know, what is um, male, female parentage and biological identity, um, all these you know, new ways of thinking about things I thought I was the expert on, um, but, you know, taking a step back, um, hearing ideas from students from different classes in the social sciences or the humanities made me uh, see my own field through a different lens and really appreciate um, all the subtle um, hidden factors that go into any topic and um, how one can really fully and deeply understand things by um, taking different viewpoints and listening to outside viewpoints on what you think you might be an expert on. Um, so I think I've grown a lot through my time at Oberlin, although you know I, I did have a lot of classes already, but I still learned a lot. Thank you. We've alas come to the end of our time here. Um, if we were all together, I know we would be applauding our panelists. We're all together in person. Um, but I'm just so grateful to all of you for um, being part of this panel. And uh, thank you, uh, Bill, for allowing me to moderate this session. It was a huge pleasure. And um, I'm sure, Bill, you have, you have an announcement to make. 
Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Cheyenne, Jesse, Mahmoud, Maureen, Kayla. You all did a fantastic job. I really enjoyed uh, this conversation and hearing all the amazing things you have done, you did during your time at Oberlin and also what you've done afterwards um, as well. Um, so thank you all again for all, everyone here in the audience for sticking with us a little bit past the hour. Uh, we really appreciate you the time you spent with us this evening. Um, I posted some a number of links in the chat, so please feel free to take a look at some of the things we talked about today in further detail as well, um, as well as uh, some links about our upcoming uh, virtual events and uh, other upcoming webinars for admitted students. And again, if you have further questions over the next few weeks as you're making your final decisions, uh, please feel free to reach out to the admissions office. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. You may have. Um, but with that, again, please give a, a round of applause for all of our wonderful panelists. Um, and we hope you stay well, be well, and we hope to see many of you on campus um, in the fall. Take care, everyone. Thank you.